Hello and welcome to lecture 12. Today we're going to finish the course. Today's lesson is mainly about singular value decomposition, but before we get to that, I want to talk some more about A transpose A. I'm going to start with a little bit of re revision all the way back from lecture three. If A is an M by N matrix, then A transpose, we swap rows to columns and columns to rows, so we get an N by M matrix. And then we can multiply A and A transpose together, because then the, the sizes are correct. A, A transpose and A transpose A are going to both be square matrices. Moreover, because if we take the transpose of a product of two matrices, A and B, we have to swap the order of the matrices. So instead of A first, B second, we swap the order so it's B first and A second, and then we can put a transpose on each matrix. The transpose of AB is B transpose A transpose. And using that, we can calculate the transpose of A A transpose, swap the order. Instead of orange then green, we want to swap it so it's green then orange, and then put a transpose on each matrix. So it's a transpose, transpose, multiplied by A transpose. But of course, A transpose, transpose is just A. So the transpose of A, A transpose is just A, A transpose. And similarly, the transpose of A transpose A is also A transpose A. This shows that both A, A transpose and A transpose A are symmetric matrices. So for example, Let's suppose A is the matrix with two rows and three columns. It's a two by three matrix. Then we can do A transpose A, and we obtain a square matrix. A transpose A is a three by three matrix. A and A transpose A will have the same number of columns. And A A transpose is going to also be a, two, a square matrix, but this time it's going to be a two by two matrix. And you can note here that both of these are symmetric matrices. You have minus 2 and minus 2, minus 11, minus 11, minus 8, minus 8, etc. If A is an invertible matrix, then A, A transpose, and A transpose A are also invertible. And this is going to be very straightforward to prove. Recall that when we take the transpose of a matrix, we don't change its determinant because we're just swapping the positions. We're swapping rows to columns and columns to rows. So row expansion along a row of A is the same as column expansion along a column of A transpose. So if they have the same determinant, then they're in. if one of them is invertible, then the other one must be invertible. And we've also seen that if we multiply two invertible matrices together, we get an invertible matrix. So if A is invertible, then A transpose is invertible. Invertible matrix multiplied by invertible matrix gives us that A, A transpose, and A transpose, A are also invertible. Now I want to state and prove six lemmata about A transpose A. For the following six lemmata, A is going to be an M by N matrix. The first lemma says that A and A transpose A have the same null space. We need to show that if the vector x0 is a solution of a x equal to 0, that's true if and only if this same vector x0 is a solution to a transpose a x equal to 0. Now, the forward direction is easy. If x0 is a solution of a x equal to 0, then a transpose a x0, you get a transpose multiplied by a x0, but of course, that's just 0. So it's A transpose multiplied by zero, which gives us zero. So that proves the forward direction. We just need to prove the reverse. We need to prove that if X zero is a solution of 
a transpose a x equal to zero, then that implies that a x zero is equal to zero. So we're going to start by supposing that x zero is a solution of a transpose a x equal to zero. And that's the same as supposing that x zero is in the null space of a transpose a. And then we need to prove that x zero is also in the null space of a. In other words, we need to show that a x zero is equal to zero too. If you think back to lecture seven, we saw that the null space of some matrix B some, um, is the same as the, row, the orthogonal complement of the row space of B. Now, <coughs> we're supposing that x0 is in the null space of A transpose A. So that's the same as saying that x0 is orthogonal to every vector in the row space of A transpose A. But wait a minute, A transpose A is symmetric. That means that its row space is the same as its column space. So if x0 is orthogonal to every vector in the row space, it must also be orthogonal to every vector in the column space of A transpose A. That's every vector. So we could pick one. We know it's orthogonal to every vector. We can pick one vector which is going to help us. And the vector we're going to pick is A transpose A x0. That's in the column space of A transpose A because the column space of A transpose A is the same as the range of the matrix transformation with matrix A transpose A. Or if you want, you can think about the way we multiply matrices together or multiply matrix by a vector. You multiply a matrix by a vector, you obtain a linear combination of the columns of that matrix. So you get something that's in the column space of that matrix. We've said that x0 is orthogonal to every vector in the column space of A transpose x. So straight away, we know that the dot product between x0 and y0 must be 0. But what can we learn from this? Well, substitute in. Last week, we saw that if we have a matrix inside a dot product, we can move it to the other vector like this, as long as we take its transpose. So I'm going to move this A transpose to the front, and it's going to be A transpose transpose, just A. But then that's just AX0 dot AX0. That's why we chose this Y, because that's just the norm of AX0 squared. So look what we have. The norm of AX0 squared is 0, so the norm is 0. The only way we can have the norm of a vector is 0 is if the vector itself is equal to 0. So we've proved that AX0 is equal to the 0 vector, and then we're finished. This proves that A transpose A has the same null space as A. Lemma number 2. A and A transpose A have the same rank. Now, remember this, this formula, rank plus nullity is equal to number of columns. A and A transpose A have the same null space, so they have the same nullity. They have the same number of columns. So, sorry. Nullity, that's the same. Number of columns, that's the same. So the rank must be the same. And that's how we prove this. A and A transpose A have the same row space. A transpose A is symmetric. That means its row space is the same as column space because its rows are the same as its columns. 
I'm saying each column of A transpose A is a linear combination of the columns in A transpose. Think about the way we multiply matrices together. Any time we multiply two matrices together, each column in the new matrix is a linear combination of the columns in the left matrix. So every column of A transpose A must be in the column space of A transpose. And that's the same as the row space of A because of how we what, what transpose means. When we take the transpose of a matrix, we swap the columns with rows and rows of columns. So the column space of A transpose must be the same as the row space of A. But A transpose A is symmetric. So the columns of A transpose A are the same as the rows of A transpose A. So we can say that every row of A transpose A is in the row space of A. This proves that the row space of A transpose A is a subspace of the row space of A. We haven't quite got proved that they're equal yet, but we've proved that the row space of A transpose A is a subspace of the row space of A. But wait a minute, they have the same rank. That means they have this, the row spaces have the same dimension. If a vector space is a subspace of another vector space, but they have the same dimension, they must be equal. So this proves that the row space of A is the same as the row space of A transpose A. A transpose and A transpose A have the same column space. But column space of A transpose is the same as the row space of A. That's what transpose does. We've just proved that the row space of A is the same as the row space of A transpose A. But A transpose A is symmetric. So the row space is a, of A transpose A is the same as its column space. And that's that proof done. A transpose A is orthogonally diagonalizable. That's another easy one to prove. A transpose A is symmetric, and all symmetric matrices are orthogonally diagonalizable. And the final lemon, lemon number six, the eigenvalues of A transpose A are non-negative. In other words, every eigenvalue of A transpose A satisfies that the eigenvalue is greater than or equal to zero. This is going to be an important idea for today. Let's prove this. Because it's orthogonally diagonalizable, think about what we were talking about last week. This means there is an orthonormal basis for Rn, because A transpose A is an n by n matrix, consisting of eigenvectors of A transpose A. Let's call these u1, u2 up to un. So these are orthogonal vectors, and each one of these is a unit vector. Let lambda 1 up to lambda m be the corresponding eigenvalues. And I wrote in bracket, these, these don't have to all be different. We might have the same number repeated in this list. Then for each eigenvalue and eigenvector, the norm of <coughs> AUI squared is greater than or equal to 0. Why? Because a norm is always greater than or equal to 0. And a norm of a vector squared just means vector dot vector. Now, the trick I was, I've been using lots of times, if we have a matrix inside a dot product like this, we can move the matrix across to the other vector as long as we take its transpose. 
This is the same as ui dot product with a transpose a ui. But because ui is an eigenvector of a transpose a, this is the same as ui dot lambda i ui. Lambda i is just a number. We can move that out. We got lambda i multiplied by ui dot ui. But ui is a unit vector. So ui dot ui is just the number one. So this proves that every eigenvalue of A transpose A must be greater than or equal to zero. Now that we know that these are all going to be non-negative, we can take square roots of these numbers. If A is an M by N matrix, and if lambda 1 up to lambda N are the eigenvalues of A transpose A, be careful, they're not eigenvalues of A, they're eigenvalues of A transpose A, because A might not be square, but A transpose A is square. Then we can take the square roots of the eigenvalues, and these are called the singular values of A. For singular values, we use the lowercase letter sigma. Now, from now on, we need to assume that the, we've sorted the eigenvalues of A transpose A, so that we're always writing the biggest one first. Whenever we find the eigenvalues, we're going to write the biggest one first, the second biggest one will be lambda 2, the third biggest one will be lambda 3, and so on. And then when we take the square roots of these eigenvalues to get the singular values, again, sigma 1 will be the biggest singular value, sigma 2 will be the second biggest, and so on. For example, find the singular values of the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. Well, first thing to do is to get A transpose A. We need to find the eigenvalues of A transpose A. So in other words, we need to find the eigenvalues of 2, 1, 1, 2. And then we're going to sort them so that they're in the right order, with biggest one first and smallest one last. And then we're going to take the square roots. The characteristic equation, oh, I've made, a, I've made a mistake here, it should be A transpose A here. The characteristic equation, 0 is equal to the determinant of lambda I minus A transpose A. You could check, gives us lambda squared minus 4 lambda plus 3, or lambda minus 3, lambda minus 1. So the eigenvalues are 3 and 1. Note that when we're doing singular value, talking about singular values, we always want to do the biggest one first. So lambda 1 is 3, lambda 2 is 1. And then to get the singular values, we take the square roots of these numbers. The singular values of A are square root of 3 and 1. So let me repeat this. If you're asked to find singular values of a matrix A, first calculate A transpose A, then find its eigenvalues, Sort them so that the biggest one is first, and then the second biggest one, and so on, and then take the square roots of those numbers. Let's do another example. Find the singular values of the matrix 4, 11, 14, 8, 7, minus 2. We need to find the eigenvalues of A transpose A. I'll leave this calculation for you to check. 
check that A transpose A is 80, 140, 100, 170, 140, 40, 140, 200. And please check that the eigenvalues of A transpose A are 360, 90, and 0. 360 is the biggest. So we put that one first. Zero is the smallest. So we put that one last. Take the square roots of these numbers to get the singular values. Sigma 1 is 6 root 10. Sigma 2 is 3 root 10. And sigma 3 is 0. What do singular values mean? Well, think about this matrix transformation. The same matrix we've just done. This transformation maps the unit sphere in R3 to the, the ellipse that I've drawn here in R2. The biggest, the biggest radius of this ellipse, which I'm calling A here, that's called the semi-major axis, is also the square root of 360, or sigma 1. And the smallest radius of this ellipse, which I'm calling B, or semi-minor axis, is same as sigma 2. Remember, sigma 3 was equal to 0. But that, that tells us that we're going from a three-dimensional object to a two-dimensional shape. If you, if you wanted to think of this ellipse as existing in three-dimensional space, then its thickness would be zero. Its thickness would be sigma three. Anyway, that's an idea of what singular values mean, but what are we going to use them for? Suppose that u1 up to un is an orthonormal basis of Rn, so that's orthogonal vectors, and each one is a unit vector. Suppose that this consists of eigenvectors of A transpose A, and as always, we're arranging these so that if we write down the list of the corresponding eigenvalues of A transpose A, we get the biggest eigenvalue first, then the second biggest, then the third best, biggest, and so on. And we're going to suppose that A has R non-zero singular values. So when we write down the list of the singular values, or even when we write down the list of these eigenvalues, we might expect we have some numbers 5, 4, 2, 1, etc. at the start, but then after that it's all zeros. How many of these are not equal to zero? We're going to say we have R singular values or R eigenvectors, eigenvalues which are not zero. Then the conclusion is that AU1, AU2 up to AUR is an orthogonal basis for the column space of A and the rank of A is equal to R. The rank of A is the same as the number of non-zero singular values of A. Let's prove this. Let's start by supposing that i is not the same as j. Because we have an orthonormal basis, take any of two of these vectors and they're orthogonal. ui dot uj must be the number 0. Therefore, aui dot auj, I'm using the same trick here where I can move the matrix A from the first vector to the second vector, as long as I take its transpose. But that's ui dot lambda j uj. But that's zero because ui is orthogonal to uj. So as long as i is not the same as j, AUI and AUJ will be orthogonal.
Hence, the set of AU1 up to AUN is an orthogonal set. Oh, I think that should be R, actually. Yes, this is a mistake. This should be R here. Oh, actually, it didn't. It didn't matter if it was R either. I'm realizing it was correct all along. Anyway, let me continue. Moreover, since the theorem says that A has R non-zero singular values, and because the norm of A U I, that's the square root of A U I dot A U I, which is the square root of lambda I square root of U I dot U I, U I is a unit vector, so ui dot ui is just one and the square root of lambda i is just a singular value sigma i we've said a has r non-zero singular values so that means as long as i is between one and r a ui is going to be not the zero vector So that means that AU1 up to AUR are linearly independent vectors. Non, how do we know this? Because non-zero orthogonal vectors must be linearly independent. And of course, AUI up to AUR are in the column space of A, because A multiplied by any vector is in the column space of A. So now we have R linearly independent vectors in the column space of A. The column space of A is R dimensional because the rank is R. So we want to, <coughs> sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we want to show that the dimension of the column space of A is R. So the final thing we need to do is to let A, Y be any vector in the column space of A. And then let x be the vector in R in which satisfies ax is equal to y. That's what color space means. Because we have an orthonormal basis for Rn, we can always write that x is a linear combination of these basis vectors. But then when we multiply on the left by a, we get a linear combination of au1 up to aur plus and remember, we said AUR was zero. AUR plus, AUR plus one, AUR plus two, AUR plus three. It said all the way up to AUN is also zero. This proves that if Y is any vector in the column space of A, then Y is in the span of AU1 up to AUR. And thus that this is an orthogonal basis for the column space of A. And we can conclude from this that because the basis has R vectors in, the dimension of the column space of A is R. Now we come on to the main topic for today's lesson. We've done the, the preliminary results that we need. Now we come to talking about singular value decomposition. A little bit of revision first. In lecture nine, we studied diagonalization. We saw that any some matrices A, we can write as P, D, P inverse, where D is a diagonal matrix. In, election, in lecture 11, we studied orthogonal diagonalization, and we saw that symmetric matrices A can be written as P, D, P transpose, where D is a diagonal matrix. Unfortunately, as we've learned, not 
all matrices can be factorized like this. Not all matrices are diagonalizable and only symmetric matrices are orthogonally diagonalizable. But there is, however, another type of factorization that's possible for any M by N matrix, and this is called singular value decomposition. And the idea here is we're going to take our matrix A, it could be any matrix A, and then we could write it as a product of U, sigma, and V transpose. Now, first thing to note here is we've got two different matrices, U and V. When we were doing diagonalization and orthogonal diagonalization, we had the same matrix at the start and it's inverse at the end or it's transpose at the end. But now we have two different matrices. The matrix sigma in the middle is going to look something like this. It's going to be an M by N matrix, so it's going to have the same size as A, and it's going to be made up of a diagonal matrix and some zero matrices. The diagonal matrix is going to be an R by R matrix, where R is the rank of A. And then we're going to fill the, the rest of the matrix in with zeros until we get a matrix which is the same size as A. Before I go on, let me just remark that, for example, if R is equal to N, then N minus R is zero. So we don't have these ones. We would just have D on top and zero underneath it. We're going to start with our diagonal matrix D, and then we're going to be adding in just enough zeros so that we end up with an M by N matrix. The singular value decomposition theorem. This is the theorem set which tells us we can do this. Let A be an M by N matrix with rank R. Then there exists an M by N matrix sigma, which is the, it's the same as on the previous slide. It's a diagonal matrix at the top left and then zeros everywhere else. For which the diagonal entries in D are the first R singular values of A, but we write them in the list such the biggest one is first then the second biggest one and so on. And there exists an M by N orthogonal matrix U and an N by N orthogonal matrix V such that A is equal to U sigma V transpose. So basically this firm says we can do singular value decomposition for any matrix. A key point here I should point out is we're interested in the rank of the matrix A. That's the number of non-zero singular values of A. And that's going to tell us how big our diagonal matrix D is. Any factorization of the form A is equal to U sigma V transpose, where U and V are orthogonal matrices, Sigma is a matrix with a diagonal matrix at the top left and zeros everywhere else. It's called a singular value decomposition or SVD of A. When we do a singular value decomposition, the matrices U and V do not have to, to be the same. I mean, they are not unique. There's different ways to find this. Different people who calculated a singular value decomposition could get different answers for their U and their V. That, that's okay. But the matrix D, and therefore the matrix sigma, is unique. Why? Well, because the diagonal entries of D must be the first are singular values of A, written in such an order that the biggest one comes first, then the second biggest one, then the third biggest one, etc. So 
even if a hundred different people did a singular value decomposition of A, they would all get the same matrix D. They would all, and so they'd all get exactly the same matrix sigma. The columns of U in an SVD are called left singular vectors, and the columns of V in an SVD are called right singular vectors of A. We're going to prove the singular value decomposition thing. It's quite a long one, so bear with me. Let V1 up to Vn be an orthonormal basis of Rn consisting of eigenvectors of A transpose A. And as always, we need to arrange them so that the corresponding eigenvalues satisfy Lambda 1 is the biggest eigenvalue, lambda 2 is the second biggest, lambda 3 is the third biggest, and so on. And then for the matrix V, we're going to write down the matrix where the first column is the first eigenvector, second column is the second eigenvector, and so on. Now, this should look familiar to you because... This matrix is an orthogonal n by n matrix. We saw this last week. And this is almost exactly the same as the matrix P that we were doing last week. It's almost exactly the same matrix P that we would use for orthogonal diagonalization. The only difference here is that when we do singular value decomposition, we're going to insist that we write the biggest eigenvalue first, and then the second biggest one, and then the third biggest one. But other than that, if you can do orthogonal diagonalization, then you can write down the matrix V. By the previous theorem, the last one at the end of the previous section, we know that AV1 up to AVR is an orthogonal basis for the column space of A. We need to normalize these vectors because we need orthonormal vectors. Well, that's easy. We'll just divide each one by its norm. The norm of AVI is the same as the singular value of A. So for each I, we're going to do UI is equal to AVI divided by the singular value sigma I. Then the vectors are still orthogonal, and now we have unit vectors. So now we have an orthonormal basis for the column space of A. That's not enough. We need an orthonormal basis for Rm. But that's OK. We'll just add in extra vectors. We'll keep adding in extra unit vectors until we get an orthonormal basis for Rm. So I've tried to show this with colors. In green, we have these vectors that we're calculating using the idea of AVI divided by sigma i. And then in green, we're just going to add in whichever, sorry, then in, let me get my colors mixed up. Then in orange, we're just going to add in some extra vectors. Now, we haven't talked much about this before. We talked briefly about this in lecture six, but I didn't give as many details as perhaps I should. And then um, this is a mistake. This should be U. Then the matrix capital U is going to be the matrix where the first column is U1, the second column is U2 all of the way up to the mth column is um. This is an orthogonal m by n matrix. 
OK, so now we have our U and we have our V. We just need to prove that they are the right matrices. What do we get if we calculate AV? A multiplied by the matrix of first column V1, second column V2, etc. That's the same as the matrix where the first column is AV1, the second column is AV2, up to AVR. And then zeros. Why zeros? Because the rank is R. That means for after R, AVI is always equal to zero. Look in the yellow box at the top. AVI, as long as I is between R and R, is the same as sigma I UI. Okay, remember this. We'll, we'll come back to this later. AV is the same as sigma 1 U1, sigma 2 U2, etc. The next thing I want to calculate is U sigma. U is the M by N matrix we just created. And sigma is this matrix which has a diagonal matrix at the top left in green. And then everywhere else it has zeros. When we multiply these two matrices together, we also get sigma 1 U1, sigma 2 U2 up to sigma R UR. And then after that, zero vectors for each column. which is the same as AV. So then we're pretty much finished. We've shown that U sigma is equal to AV. Multiply on the right by V transpose. U sigma V transpose is equal to A. And that was the, the last proof I'm going to do in this course. So, yes, it was a difficult one, but it's the, that's the last one in this course. Now I'm going to take a break until 3 o'clock, and then I'm going to do some examples of singular value decomposition.
And let's continue. I want to explain how we can do a singular value decomposition. Let A be an M by N matrix, which has rank R. Step one, we want to find an orphan normal basis for Rn, consisting of eigenvectors of A transpose A. Finding a basis of eigenvectors is going to be straightforward, but how do we turn that into an orphan normal basis? We used a Gram-Schmidt process. Then we're going to rearrange these however we need to so that the biggest eigenvalue is called lambda 1, the second biggest eigenvalue is called lambda 2, etc. Step 2, we're going to write down the matrix capital V to be the n by n matrix where the first column is v1, the second column is v2, and all of the way up to the final column is vn. This is going to be an orthogonal matrix. How do we know that? Because its columns are orthonormal. Step three. For each one of these vectors between 1 and R, where R is the rank of A, we're going to do U1 is AV1 divided by sigma1, U2 is AV2 divided by sigma2, etc. All of the way up to UR is AVR divided by sigma, where each one of these sigma i's are the singular values of A. We need to have M orthonormal vectors, and so far we only have R orthonormal vectors, so we're going to have to add in an extra M minus R vectors so that we do get an orthonormal basis for R, M. And then after we've done that, step five, we're going to let our matrix capital U be the matrix where the first column is U1, the second column is U2, all of the way up to mth column is Um. Because these columns are orthonormal, we will have an orthogonal matrix. And then step six, we're going to write A is U equal to U sigma V transpose, where sigma is the M by N matrix of this form. We have the diagonal matrix at the top left, an R by R diagonal matrix, where the entries on the diagonal are the singular values of A, and then everywhere else will be zeros. So, for example, if R is less than N, then we will need to put an R by N minus R zero matrix in just here. If R is equal to N, then we will not have any of this. Okay, so let's do some examples. Find a singular value decomposition of this matrix. We've looked at this matrix earlier, and we've seen that the eigenvalues of A transpose A are 3 and 1, and that means that the singular values are root 3 and 1. Biggest one first, and then the smallest one second. I'm going to leave it for you to check that these vectors, V1 and V2, are eigenvalues corresponding to different, to lambda 1 and lambda 2 respectively. And I'm going to leave it for you to check that this is an orphan normal basis for R2. The basis part is easy if we have linearly independent vectors. And orthogonal vectors are always linearly independent. So what you would need to check is two things. Check that V1 is orthogonal to V2. And check that both of these are unit vectors. If both of those facts are true, then we have an orphan normal basis. Now that we have V1 and V2, we can write down our first matrix. V is the matrix with first column V1, second column V2. Okay. 
if we wanted to orthogonally diagonalize a transpose A, then we could use this matrix. This matrix will orthogonally diagonalize A transpose A. So that's V. We also need to find U and sigma. To calculate U1 and U2, the formula is we're going to do AV1 divided by sigma1 and we're going to do AV2 divided by sigma2. I'll leave these calculations for you to check. If I haven't made any mistakes, I calculate that u1 is root 6 over 3, root 6 over 6, root 6 over 6, and I calculate that u2 is 0 minus root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. But remember that we need u to be a 3 by 3 matrix. We found the first two columns of U, we found U1 and U2, but we also need to find a third column. We need to find a unit vector U3 such that U1, U2, U3 is an orphan normal basis for R3. We need to put one more vector into our basis so that we get not just a basis for the column space of A, but a basis for R3. So what we need is we need to find a unit vector U3 that is orthogonal to both U1 and U2. To make our calculations a little bit easy, instead of looking for a unit vector U3 which is orthogonal to U1 and U2, let's look for a unit vector U3 which is orthogonal to root 6 U1 and root 2 U2. Just because Root 6, U1, and root 2, U2 are simpler vectors, so it's going to simplify our calculations. And if U3 is orthogonal to both of these vectors, then it's also going to be orthogonal to both U1 and U2. So we're just making our life a little bit easier here. So we want to find a unit vector U3, which is a solution to this homogeneous linear system. You know how to solve linear systems. We did it all of the way back in lecture one. So I'm going to leave it for you to check that the general solution to this homogeneous linear system is some number t multiplied by minus 1, 1, 1. So the unit vector that we want is going to be minus 1, 1, 1 divided by the norm of minus 1, 1. We want the unit vector minus 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3. OK, so we know U1, we know U2, and we know U3. Our second matrix, capital U, is going to be the matrix of first column U1, second column U2, third column U3. Then after that, we can write down the singular value decomposition. The singular value decomposition of A is going to be A is equal to U sigma V transpose. We found U, we found V. Doing the transpose of V, that's easy. Sigma must be the same size as A. A is a 3 by 2 matrix, so sigma must be a 3 by 2 matrix. We have our diagonal matrix where the entries on the main diagonal are the singular values, so that's root 3 and 1. And then we finish it off just by writing some zeros everywhere else. And then that's it. That's the end of that example. Let's do another one. Find a singular value decomposition of the matrix A is equal to 4, 11, 14, 8, 7, minus 2. This is another one we've looked at earlier. The eigenvalues of A transpose A are 360, 90, and 0. And just repeating myself again, the first eigenvalue is the biggest one. 
The second eigenvalue is the second biggest one, and the third eigenvalue is the smallest one. We need eigenvectors of A transpose A, which correspond to these eigenvalues. I'm going to leave it for you to check that these are, and I'm going to leave it for you to check that these eigenvalues, after we've done the Gram-Schmidt process, but we've got three different eigenvalues, so really we're just normalizing them. I'll leave it for you to check that these three vectors are often normal. So we have our first matrix. Capital V is the matrix first column V1, second column V2, third column V3. We also need a sigma and we need a U. <coughs> the singular values of A are 6 root 10, 3 root 10 and 0. We're only interested in the non-zero singular values. So forget about sigma 3, we don't want that. We just want the singular values which are not equal to 0. Our diagonal matrix is going to be the matrix 6 root 10, 0, 0, 3 root 10. Remember that the matrix sigma must be the same size as the matrix A that we started with. We started with a 2 by 3 matrix, so the sigma must be a 2 by 3 matrix. Sigma must have this diagonal matrix D in the upper left, and it must have zeros everywhere else. So we take out D, put it top left, and then we fill in zeros everywhere else, and then we have our sigma. So that's two matrices done. We need to find one more. We need to construct our matrix capital U. Because A has two non-zero singular values, we know that the rank of A is equal to 2. So we're going to be using the formula for U1 and U2. The formula is that U1 is 1 divided by sigma 1, AV1, and U2 is 1 divided by sigma 2, AV2. And I'm going to leave these calculations for you to, to, you to check. I think we get 3 root 10 divided by 1 root 10 and 1 root 10 divided by, so 1 root divided by root 10 minus 3 divided by root 10. This is already a basis for R2. So we don't need to any, add any extra vectors in. This time we're finished. So our third and final matrix that we need is the matrix capital U. First column U1, second column U2. And then we've pretty much finished our answer. Because now we know that a singular value decomposition of A is the matrix A is equal to U sigma V transpose, where now we found U, we found sigma, and we found V. Let's do another one, and this is the final example of this course. Find a singular value decomposition of the matrix. 1 minus 1 minus 2, 2, 2 minus 2. First, well, we haven't looked at this matrix before, so first thing to do is to calculate A transpose A. You can check for me that's 9 minus 9 minus 9, 9. We need to find the eigenvalues of this and corresponding eigenvectors. So again, check for me that the eigenvalues of A transpose A are 18 and 0. Biggest one first, smallest one second. 
and corresponding eigenvectors are 1 minus 1 and 1, 1. These are orthogonal, but they're not orthonormal. So we need to normalize them. Divide each eigenvector by its norm to find v1 and v2. And then after we know v1 and v2, we know our first matrix, capital V, is the matrix with first column v1, second column v2. That's the first matrix. We still have two matrices to find. The singular values are pre root 2 and 0. Because there's only one non zero singular value, that means that D is going to be a one by one matrix. Sigma must have the same size as A. We've started with a 3 by 2 matrix, so sigma must be a 3 by 2 matrix, and it must have D in its upper left corner. So sigma must look like this. It must have D at the top left, and then put in enough zeros so that you end up with a 3 by 2 matrix. So sigma is the matrix of 3 root 2, that's our one non-zero singular value, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. zero. That's two matrices done and one to go. To construct U, we need to calculate AV1 and AV2. AV1, we can calculate as 2 over root 2, minus 4 over root 2, 4 over root 2, and AV2 is 0, 0, 0. Of course, it's zero because the singular value, the second singular value was zero. So actually, we didn't need to calculate this. We, would, we knew this was going to be zero. We're going to normalize the first one of these. U1 is 1 divided by sigma 1, AV1. We obtain that U1 is the vector 1 third minus 2 thirds Okay, we've got one vector, but capital U needs to be a 3 by 3 matrix. We need an orthonormal basis for R3. So this time we're going to have to add in two more vectors. We need to add in two orthogonal unit vectors, U2 and U3. Each of U2 and U3 must be orthogonal to U1. So we're going to look at the general solution of all vectors which are orthogonal to U1. And just to make the calculation a little bit easier, instead of dealing with one So instead of dealing with numbers one third and two thirds, I'm just going to multiply it by three just to make the calculation a little bit easier. So we want to find the general solution of zero is equal to three u one dot x, or in other words, the general solution of x one minus two x two plus two x three. And I'll leave it for you to check that the general solution to this is S multiplied by the vector 210 plus T multiplied by the vector minus 201. How did I do this? Well, I decided I wanted 1, 0, and 0, 1 in the second and third positions. And then I used the formula to calculate what the top number should be. I 
I'm going to leave it for you to check that this green vector is orthogonal to U1 and this orange vector is also orthogonal to U1. However, the green vector and the orange vector are not orthogonal to each other. So what do we do? If we have a basis which is not orthogonal, we use the Gram-Schmidt process. Now, I'm running out of the usual letters that I was using. I've already used X and U and V so and W, so we need a new letter, and I'm going to call this new letter Z. Just as the next letter that came to my mind. There's nothing special about the letter Z. When we did a Gram-Schmidt process, you think back to a couple of weeks ago, First, mate, the first vector doesn't change, so Z2 is just W2. And then the formula for Z3, we do W3 minus the part of W3 which points in the same direction as Z2. So minus W3 dot Z2 divided by the normal Z2 squared multiplied by Z2. And if you check that, if you check this calculation for me, I think it's minus 2 over 5, 4 over 5, 1. So now we have orthogonal vectors. We're not finished yet because we need orthonormal vectors. So we have to normalize these two vectors. U2 is going to be Z2 divided by the norm of Z2, and U3 is going to be Z3 divided by the norm of Z3. And then the hard work is finished. Capital U is the square matrix, the square three by three matrix, where the first column is U1, second column is U2, and third column is U3. And now we have everything that we need. Therefore, a singular value decomposition for A looks like this. We found U, we found sigma, we found V, so we can write down new sigma v transpose. And that is the end of the final example in this course. This is the end of your linear algebra course. Are there any questions? Uh, hello, Professor. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, was there a makeup exam for the second midterm or something? There, there will be one. It's, it's this week on Friday. Okay. The first midterm is there. Is there also an, another an, a makeup for it, or? Yes. The the first makeup is on Thursday, and the second makeup is on Friday. If you look through the announcements, I've written the. Um, the classroom and the time. Let me just remind you though, you can only take the makeup exam if you missed the original exam and if you have permission from the Dean's office. Yeah, exactly. I have a permission because I had late registration. So uh, I, have, I, 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 have, I have the right to take some of the makeup exams. So uh, I'm sorry, again, where did you write the classes and the time exactly? On OLEARN or where? It, is in Olearn, click announcements on the left and then scroll down 
you'll find the makeup midterm exam schedule. Okay, I found it. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Uh, I'm sorry, but I had another question. I don't know, like, can I ask another question? Yes, of course. Okay, so the, the, the thing is, um, because of my late registration, I missed some of the homeworks. So it, I'm just asking, I'm just asking a question. Is there a possibility to do them or they close? Yes, all, all the homeworks are available until the day of the final exam. So and, until Okay, okay. Monday the 23rd of May, you can still do all of the homework. Okay, I understand. Thank you very much. 